Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the services tonight. We are broadcasting live here from uh, Haynesport, and I had a special invitation to join uh, Tom and Deanna and the kids over here at the house, and uh, wonderful dinner tonight, but it's great to be able to uh, come to you this evening for our prayer meeting, our Bible study tonight, and I just want to welcome you to the services. Uh, we're going to start with some singing, and... Uh, have just a couple announcements. Uh, we'll be going through our Bible verse tonight with Brother Stephen uh, over in Pemberton and uh, then coming back for the preaching. And so, uh, Tom, come on up here and uh, let's, let's sing a song together. 
Okay, we're going to go ahead and sing the old rugged cross. We're doing the uh, first and second verse there. I'm just making sure I'm doing this right. So here we go. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sin. Just a real quick announcement. Um, we, you, fellas, you know from our uh, men's meeting uh, a few weeks ago, we are going to get started uh, back up, back started, back, getting started back up with our construction project downstairs. And uh, uh, Brother Dennis and I would like to invite you to come give us a hand uh, on two, on next, uh, next week on Tuesday. Um, if you can come over, what we need to do is clean out all those classrooms downstairs uh, get all the materials out of there, particularly the construction materials, get them relocated. So if you have next Tuesday open, if you could uh, do this, give uh, Brother Dennis a call uh, and let him know of your availability and he'll work out whatever details are necessary. Uh, but we'd like to get those classrooms cleared out as quickly as possible so we can get started with some demolition. So please give us a hand. So get a hold of Brother Dennis let them know of uh, the opportunities that you have to give a hand for that. So that's Tuesday, next week, Tuesday. All right, that's all the announcements I have for right now, with the exception of saying um, we have plans for our services this weekend. Um, if, um, if we make any changes, I'll let you know well ahead of time. Uh, but uh, just pay attention to text messages and stuff in reference to services uh, this coming Sunday, okay? All right, Thomas, if you would, please. Yeah, also, um, keep in mind, we're going to be saying the verse here with Stephen. If you're going to say your verse, cram it cram it real quick, and then uh, give, uh, I think it's Diane's cell phone and, uh, number a call. You'll see the number on the on the screen there. Keep in mind, there is like a 30-second delay or so. So um, keep that in mind, but uh, go ahead and do some last-second cramming, and then uh, give Stephen a call. Here you go, Stephen.
0.9. So I will give you guys a second to work on that, to dial the number in. Oh, I was muted the whole time, apparently. Hey, hey, everybody. So I'm going to go right ahead real quick and read our memory verse for the month of March. It is Proverbs 16, 32, which is he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Uh, we, we were just giving you some more time to, to cram that verse in is all we were doing. Uh, so if you want to give us a call to say that verse live, uh, 609-997-5409, it is Diane's number. Uh, so go ahead and give us a call so you can get your wowie face. And like Tom said, there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm just going to give everybody a little bit more time to get that over. And let's check in. No. Okay. Well, uh, keep working on that, guys. Um, I think uh, if there's any stragglers calling in, we're, you're, there's going to be another chance to, to do the verse. But uh, back to you, Tom. Well, thank you, Stephen. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. I was swapping a bunch of things around before church. And uh, I forgot to hit a button, so it was not Stephen's fault, just so you know. Okay, let's do some more singing. I'll be watching for Stephen, so if you're going to say your verse, go ahead and try to give him a call during the singing here, and, uh, and we'll get to you here after the song. So here we go, um, How Great Thou Art. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds I hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is played. Then see my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, that's uh, verse number two. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burdens gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my sin God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great singing thank you so much Stephen. we got anyone no okay well thanks for singing along and uh we got pastor right here so we're going to go ahead and uh, switch over to the service all thank right you. thank you very much thomas and uh, brother Stephen. thank you 
going to just scoot something around a little bit here so I have more room to preach. And uh, I do appreciate uh, Tom and Deanna opening up their home uh, that we could uh, come on over tonight. My dear wife and I uh, certainly did enjoy a couple days away and I do appreciate uh, the wonderful um, birthday greetings that were extended to Joyce uh, this past week for her birthday. And uh, it's, uh, it's a blessing to be back. We had a a really nice uh, couple days away. It's very relaxing for us. But um, I'm not wearing a tie tonight. I don't know if my kids noticed that. I used to always tell the boys uh, when they were younger, I said, if, uh, I said you ha- if the preacher's wearing a tie, you have to wear a tie. So um, I know Tom didn't have a tie on tonight. So with Buzz or Eric, if you're at home and you're wearing a tie, you can take your ties off because I'm not wearing a tie tonight, okay? So I'm really giving you guys a break. So... Um, I want to direct your attention this evening over to uh, Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, if you would. And um, we have been going, of course, through the book of Acts and uh, looking at the early church and its ministry and the growth of the church and the progression of the ministry as, um, of course, uh, out of Jerusalem uh, with the the first church that Christ started, the uh, empowering of the church on the day of Pentecost. And we see that early church and its growth and the persecution, of course, that arose the church in Antioch and its beginning, uh, and now this uh, first missions journey uh, by Paul and Barnabas, and uh, that's where we're at right now. Uh, uh, We're in, uh, of course, Paul has gone, and Barnabas have gone to to Antioch, Pisidia, uh, Lystra, Derbe, and Iconium, and they've been preaching, and and this is where we're at now uh, with that ministry. And these particular verses, verse number We're in Acts chapter 14. I'm going to be reading verse number 21 through 23. And um, this is kind of like part number three. Uh, If you have last week's outline, you may notice I kind of changed the title a little bit. I hope it doesn't confuse you too much. Uh, But the basic ingredients of a successful ministry. And we looked at several of them um, over the last two weeks. Uh, Tonight we're adding two more ingredients kind of like a wonderful chocolate cake. You just can't get enough stuff in there to make it even taste better. And so uh, I'm going to read the text. We'll have a, have a word of prayer and get with the message tonight. This is Acts chapter 14, beginning of verse number 21. The scripture says this, When they had preached the gospel in, uh, to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they committed, commended them to the Lord on whom they believe. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, then we'll get to the preaching tonight. Father, I just want to thank you. Uh, what a joy it is to be able to get together this evening uh, for the teaching of your word, this Bible study tonight. I pray, dear Father, that you would help us, Lord, to understand the uh, basic uh, and most important ingredients uh, to a successful ministry. And, Lord, that we may not only see these things in our ministry, but that we will um, see them as we reproduce ourselves in other ministries. And, Father, that we be very mindful to make sure that we ourselves personally are dedicated to the truth of the Word of God and that, that our church is established on these basic fundamental principles, and that, Lord, we see others, um, other ministries beginning from our ministry, uh, reproducing these very same things. And now, Father, guide us in all truth tonight. Help us to understand um, the words that we'll, uh, that we'll see this evening. And, dear Father, be glorified in our life and in our church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're talking about some very, uh, very uh, simple and basic things uh, in reference to the work of the ministry. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about preaching and teaching, and that's this is what it says here, that they preached the gospel to that city and taught many. And so we see preaching and teaching. You know, I, I do want to remind you that, you know, the, the work of the ministry um, and the Holy Spirit of God, as, as he works in a church, uh, provides a pastor and teacher. And we see the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, basic fundamental, most important, top of the list. I mean, if you don't have preaching and teaching, let's, let's just face it, you don't have a ministry. Um, a, a ministry is not about programs. It's not about activities. It's not about 
you know, just getting together and having fellowship, it starts with that fundamental basic of preaching the gospel and teaching the word of God to those that are in the ministry. Preaching and teaching. We talked about confirming. That's the next thing that we see here. Uh, that they return to, uh, again, I'm looking at that verse, in verse number 22, it says, confirming the souls of the disciples. That, that, is, that, that is discipleship, and that's generally um, the, the understanding of the word confirming is talking about strengthening, building a, a, a firm foundation. We've got the preaching and teaching, we've got the gospel and the teaching of the word of God, that, that is there. Laid on top of that is this discipleship. This foundation is, is stabilized, it's made firm, Without this follow through, uh, and, you know, people people being saved is a wonderful thing. Uh, please, I, I don't dis, I don't diminish that at all. Uh, but the the responsibility is not over at that point. Uh, you know, going to all, all all you know, going to all the world, um, teaching, and then uh, and then baptizing, of course, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. The basics of the Word of God are, are essential, and then we continue to build on that foundation with instruction after instruction after instruction, the Word of God being taught. We talked about exhorting, and that's what it says, of course, in this text here, that they not only continued um, uh, by confirming the souls, but then exhorting them to continue in the faith. This is that encouragement because the work of the ministry is difficult. There are always going to be adversaries. The road is rough. And believers need to be encouraged. So we talked about that. Last week we talked about ordaining. And that's what it says in verse number 23, that they had ordained them elders in every church. We talked about ordination. Uh, this is, you know, that, that's that observation of individual. Uh, th these are men who have, have God has, has put a burden in their heart for the work of the ministry. Um, Paul and Barnabas. Um, are observing them and saying, you know, this, 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 it's very obvious that God's doing a work in this man's life. And so they focus their attention and, and preparing that individual uh, for the work and then ordaining. We talked about an ordination service. Um, and it's not just a ritual. It's not just going through the motions. It's that identification of an individual that God is doing a work in. Um, we had an ordination service, of course, at New Testament Baptist Church 20-some 20, 20 years ago. Uh, when uh, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church identified me as, as, uh, as an individual uh, suited for the ministry here at New Testament Baptist and the laying on of hands, the ordination service. Uh, I've been to many ordination services. They're not always the same. I will say this. Um, I've, I've heard from other missionary, from missionaries in, in other countries um, that some ordination services sometimes last for days. And we're talking about uh, interrogation and, and wanting to know somebody's doctrine and, and lots of questions. I, I've been to some ordination services that have lasted just a very short period of time. Generally, when you get to that point, um, you, you know the individual, you know their doctrine. I've been to somewhere it's uh, it's it's not gone as well uh, because you know you begin to ask questions and you begin to realize this this individual really doesn't understand some very important things about doctrine. It's it's not about you know, are you, or do you have an education? It's not about do you have a degree. It's, it's an understanding of the Word of God and how it applies to the ministry. And if you don't have that nailed down, then you, then you ought not to be ordained. And, and so it, it is a confirmation that individuals truly have uh, been called by God and, it's ident and the other ministers and folks in that ministry identify with that. I, I, I neglected to read one verse of scripture last week as we were going through that section on ordination. So this is, I haven't got to our message yet for tonight. Uh, but it, uh, I want to read just one, um, uh, um, it's, it's 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, verse number 21 and 22. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 21 and 22 says this. I, and this is Paul speaking to Timothy who is working in the, in the city of Ephesus at the church there that's getting established. And he's giving him instructions about getting this church organized. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of another man's sins. Keep thyself pure. You see that phrase, lay hands suddenly on no man. That's talking about an ordination where, you know, I, if you've ever seen an ordination service, 
they usually have a, the, the fellow that's being ordained, they're, they're usually, you know, kneeling down. A group of men are around them. They put their hands on him and have a word of prayer. Um, that is not just a ritual that we do. Uh, it is uh, this identification. We, we understand and identify that this individual is suitable for the work of the ministry. And, and so and, and Paul, and Paul is giving Timothy these instructions about not laying hands suddenly on any man. Not, not extending preference or partiality, not allowing uh, someone to get ordained into the ministry, uh, basically, if you would, for the wrong reason. Um, I, right, uh, I just started reading this book this past week. Um, it's called The History of the Donatists. And if, you're, if you know anything about Baptist history, the Donatists were an early group of, of believers in northern Africa, um, and um, this, or we're going back. This is uh, this would be like uh, uh, what 350 A.D. Uh, into early 400. So this is you know yeah ancient history, but it's our history. It's Baptist history, and um, there was a very large church in northern Africa in the it would be the country of, of Tunisia today, um, in, the, in the city of Carthage, and um, they laid hands suddenly. <laughs> On an individual, there was a, there was a man, uh, the pastor that was there um, at that large church in Carthage was um, had passed away. Uh, a new man was selected, but he was selected quickly. Uh, and the reason for that is because he had a propensity towards accepting the authority of the government, which was of course uh, Constantine, and uh, Constantine was trying to control all the churches in the empire. This was the fledgling Roman Catholic Church. And so a, a man was selected that had this, um, um, you know, was partial to this type of form of, of church government. And it caused a big stink. And other preachers were standing up going, you can't do this. And, and it was kind of like done off to the side in secret. And it was, it was by partiality. That's the very thing that Paul warns Timothy about, and he says that you be not partakers in their in their in another man's sins. This is exactly what happened back then, and it caused this tremendous uh, stir among believers. What an amazing event that took place over the next what hundred and some years, as as this group of of, of what we would identify by by doctrine as Baptists. Uh, standing up against this rise of Romanism, trying to control the churches uh, back in the 300s and in the early, into the 400s. This is what happens. And so ordination is a, is a big deal. I mean, just think about this. A any church is just one pastor away from destruction, one pastor away from heresy, one pastor away from going the route that is going to destroy that ministry. That, I mean, that story's been told I don't know how many times over. I've seen it. You've seen it. So this idea of ordaining a man that is not suitable for the work of the ministry based on doctrine is essential. So every church, our church, needs to be careful. Every church needs to be careful in identifying men that are qualified for the work of the ministry, not simply by education, but they understand doctrine. They understand what the Word of God says, and that they, they are identified by that church as saying, yes, this individual, we feel that God has called him, and we will identify, uh, we will have him identify with us as a man suitable for the ministry. So ordination is not just a ritual. It's not just something that we do. It is an essential part of the purity of the Lord's church and needs to be taken seriously. And I'll let you know how the rest of that book goes. I'm enjoying it. I love history and uh, this history of these early, um, early Baptists uh, fascinates me and the struggles that they went through to try to maintain the purity of the Lord's church. These are our forefathers and this is the same battle that we're still in today. Okay. Um, let's, uh, as Let's get to our message for tonight, okay? The next two ingredients that you'll see, uh, and if you, uh, the outline I know is up on the screen there, 
And the next two ingredients that you'll see is there again in verse number uh, 23 uh, of our text, um, uh, which says this, uh, and this is back in, in Acts chapter 14 and verse, number, uh, and verse number 23. It says, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so here we see these last two ingredients that's pray, praying and fasting, prayer and fasting, or fasting and prayer. And uh, we also see, of course, the, um, the commending uh, to the Lord. So we're going to talk, first of all, about uh, fasting and praying. And uh, verse number 23, of course, presents that. And the reason there needs to be fasting and praying is because this is a this is spiritual business. This is not just church work. This is not just, again, ritual. This is not just, you know, business is normal. It, it, we are dependent on God for this. I, I want to remind you that Paul, of course, is the primary um, man here as far as this this, this, uh, this work of the ministry. Of course, we started with Barnabas and Saul, and now we have Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul and Barnabas, of course, were our missionaries sent out of the church in Antioch. So if you got your Bibles there, just go back with me a few pages to Acts chapter 13. And of course, their names are mentioned there in verse number one. But verse, if you would drop down to verse number three, this is Acts 13, three, that says this, and when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them. Um, they sent them away. Now, does that sound real familiar? We see the laying on of the hands, of course, the identification that these guys were suitable missionaries to be sent out of that church. But do you see the other ingredient that is uh, that that Saul or Bar uh, Paul or Barnabas would have been very familiar with, and that is the uh, fasting and praying. It, it was uh, apparently it was a, an important part of their sending, their ordination, their identification, and, and certainly they what they were doing is repeating the same thing. There in the churches there in Antioch. This, it says churches, multiple churches involved here. So we're talking about cities of Derby and Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, Pisidia. And so um, this is this is important stuff because they're going to turn the ministry over to these men and they're going to leave. And if they don't have the right men, it's going to be a mess. And so they're, they're they have this dependence upon God. Praying and fasting is an essential part of the ministry. You know, certainly, certainly in the ministry, it can be taken, even prayer and fasting, as a ritual. I mean, even, even the Lord Jesus Christ identified that with the, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees even in his day. And he even spoke about that, uh, about, about their kind of ritualistic approach to a lot of things. And, and so the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they would have prayed and they would have fasted. I fast twice in a week, you know. We see that uh, the, uh, the uh, of course, the parable that, or the story that Christ teaches about the uh, the public, the Pharisee and the publican, and, and both of them praying, and, and one identifying with how righteous he was because of his fasting, and, and so, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about just going through the motions and just doing things just because they're religiously acceptable, you know. Fasting uh, and praying was an essential part. Uh, of, of believers' lives, we see it all throughout the scriptures. We see men like 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 Nehemiah. What a great example that is in Nehemiah chapter one, uh, when Nehemiah was there and he's in he's in um, he's in you know captivity, part of the extension of the Babylonian captivity. Now the Medo Persians are now in control, but he's still there and has been there primarily all of his life, but his heart's desire is towards the city of Jerusalem. And he hears about the city being in ruins. And, and what does he do? He fasts and he prays. And, and God takes this burden that's now on his heart. And because of the fasting and the praying, it, it, it begins to solidify into something that is going to eventually lead to his ministry of rebuilding the city. Fasting and praying takes the burden of the heart and brings it into something that is tangible and, and real. 
And that's what happened in Nehemiah's life. You have men like Daniel, who, again, Babylonian captivity time. And he's there, and he's reading the scriptures. He's got the book of Jeremiah, and he's reading about God's promises of restoration and deliverance. And he's, and he, he's doing the math. Seventy years have been accomplished, and he's realizing he's getting to that point. And, he, and what's he do? He fasts and he prays. This is what the scripture says. I'm just going to read that. And, I, and I'm in, it's Daniel 9, 3. He says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And he begins to pour out his heart to God. You read through the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel fasted often. And he was a man of prayer. And God did great things things in his life. God answered many questions. God showed him many wonderful things. God opened up his mind and his heart to God's plan, not only for his life personally, but for the nation of Israel. And, and one of the things you'll see about, about Daniel is a life of prayer and fasting. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> spoke about the power of of course, when he spoke to his disciples, they were that they had the ability of casting out demons. It's an amazing thing, but there was one time they couldn't do it, and they questioned, "Why couldn't we do that?" And he said, "He said, uh, he said, the, the, he said, these um, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting." Uh, so though, that combination together is a tremendous thing: prayer and fasting. Now. Um, in, in the outline, uh, if you see it up there on the screen, it says prayer and fasting is about the struggle we all have between the spirit and the flesh. Uh, and just, just think about this for just a second. Now, fasting is a denial of the flesh. It's where we, we don't eat for a period of time. I mean, and, uh, this is not a lesson on fasting, but certainly as you look through the scriptures, you'll see fasting of different sorts. For some, it's just until the sun goes down. You'll see that fasting till Eden. You'll see others, you know, where you have multiple days uh, of fasting. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ did it. Moses did it. Others uh, for multiple days. Daniel is said to have fasted for many days. And so it's not an uncommon thing, but I just want to mention this. It's a denial, of, of the denial that you're, you're not eating food. It's a denial to the flesh. It's, it's, it's saying no to the flesh. And, and prayer, of course, if, if, if fasting is, a, is denying the flesh, prayer is depending upon the Spirit. We're talking about depending on God. It's that struggle between flesh and Spirit. We're denying the flesh and we're depending on God. Prayer and fasting. It's not, it's not a matter of just setting aside. And I, you know, I know I've, I've said this, I'm sure, from the pulpit on many times, that when there's prayer and you, you have a time of fasting and prayer, so often you take that time that you have, maybe it's a meal time where you'd normally be sitting and eating your lunch somewhere to go have a time of prayer. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I am saying is this is that, at that during that time of fasting, it's not just a matter of having some extra time to pray. That's not what it's about. It's not about setting aside extra time. It's about setting aside the flesh. It's about saying no to the flesh. It, it's, it, let's just face this. I mean, eating is one of the most basic and common to all of us, a, an activity of the flesh. And it's our understanding that, that we are not dependent upon fleshly things in order to do the work of the ministry, in order to serve God. We have, we have to come to the realization where we say, no, it's not about the flesh. It is all about the spirit. And so by, by denying ourselves of fleshly things, and we are saying, what is important to me is not the flesh, but the spirit. And we focus ourselves upon spiritual things. This, this, uh, let's just, can we all just realize this? This is the struggle, the constant battle that all of us as the children of God have day after day. And that is the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. 
I want to read a couple of verses of scripture. It's in the book of Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 16. Galatians 5, 16. It says this. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now please notice the verse number 17 as it continues. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Do you see that? He's talking about that struggle. The one wanting to take advantage of the other. The Lord Jesus Christ said it very plainly as he spoke to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. That the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is what we deal with all the time. It's that battle. Let me continue in verse number 17, where it says, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. In other words, they're at odds with one another. They're at enmity. They struggle against one another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. I mean, even Paul the Apostle talked about that in Romans chapter 7. The things that he, that he wouldn't do, the, or the things he can't do, and the things he doesn't want to do, or the things that he does. He understood that. The Lord Jesus Christ presents that. Paul talks about that. This is what we all deal with. Prayer and fasting is about the um, saying, denying or saying no to the flesh so that we can focus our attention on the things of the Spirit. Prayer and fasting combined together. This is a primary ingredient to a successful ministry. You see that back in the church in Antioch, prayer and fasting. This was, again, wasn't just a ritual, wasn't something they just did. And, you know, that just, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna send a missionary out, we've got to have a day of prayer and fasting, you know, put it on the schedule. This is something that they realized. If we if this is going to be successful, we can't do it in the flesh. We need God. Uh, we are dependent upon God if this is going to work. And so this is this is what we see here uh, as Paul is continuing this the ministry as he is it, these are his first real church plants that we see in the scriptures. And so if, you, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. And if you're going to do it right, then you've got to do it God's way. And if you're going to do it God's way, you got to, you got to, you got to, you've got to call out to him. You've got, to do, you've got to say, I can't do this in the flesh. I've got to do this in the spirit. You, you see what they're doing here? Fasting and prayer. They, those two go hand in hand. Denying the flesh, depending on the spirit. And this was a vital part of the work of the ministry. Now back in our text here in chapter 14 of the book of Acts, and again in verse number 23, <clears throat> and it says that they, uh, they prayed with fasting, and they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Of, of course, at, at this point, of course, this idea of whom they believed, we're talking about the fact that they were believers. I, don't wanna, I didn't want to spend a lot of time with that. It wasn't my, my, my intention at all. But let me just say that the work of the ministry is not for the unsaved. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a profession. It's not a matter of just saying, well, you know, if, you know, if nothing else, I can at least, you know, go into the ministry. I mean, what fool would want to do that anyway, you know? Go into the ministry just for the fun of it. Um, I may not pay good, but the, the, the benefits are wonderful, right? The... Um, the ministry is is um, is for believers. It's the children of God that have faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and put themselves at the disposal of the Lord that saved them, to use them any way that He would see fit. And so, we see that word commended. So we we this is an ingredient this commending to the Lord now. Please notice the reason we do that is because this is the Lord's business. It says, the commend, it, 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 uh, again, verse number 23, it says, um, he said, uh, they commended them to the Lord. Uh, you'll notice from the outline there, uh, it says, by definition, the word commend 
It means to set before. That Literally, that's what it means. That's what the word means, to set before. And the idea is to, to give to the care or keeping of another. So to commend is, is handing something, something in this place, in this case, someone, handing someone over to God and say, Lord, you need, you need to take care of this. You need to take care of this individual. You need to be in charge of this. So it's taking responsibility. I'm not, I'm not, we're not talking about shirking responsibility, but we're, we're entrusting the responsibility to God. I'm reminded of the fact that the ministry is not about man's ability. It's about God's ability. It's not about, it's not about man's um, planning or his strategy or his, his, you know, his way of, of getting things done. It truly is a successful ministry that is God-honoring, relies completely upon the Lord for its accomplishment. And so when we see this commending, that's what we're talking about. If you would, you're here in the book of Acts. Go forward with me to Acts chapter 20. And um, particularly verse number 32 is where we're going to look. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 32. This portion of scripture, of course, this is on Paul's, towards the end of Paul's last missionary journey. So we're years down the road from where we're at in chapter 14. Uh, and the, the church, of course, is the church in, in Ephesus and um, Paul is going to be cruising by back to Jerusalem. He asked that the elders of that church come and meet him at a different location so they can, that he can have a kind of a last conversation with them just to remind them of, of some things. You know, basically, just trying to encourage them because he knows uh, things are going to get rough. And, and he, he speaks to them about some of the dangers uh, that, are go that are going to be coming up. And he says uh, in particular, in uh, Acts uh, chapter 20, verse number 32, it says this, and now, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I think it's very interesting of that, of that combination together. Do you, you see that? This, this dependence upon God to take care of or to continue this ministry is connected directly by the Apostle Paul, directed, connected directly to the Word of God. Because if we, if, we, if we try to do the work of the ministry, aside from the instructions of the Scriptures, then we're going to make a mess. It, it's not about you know, the latest book that's been written or the latest you know, methodology which is floating around amongst, amongst Christendom. It's about simply following the teachings, the commandments, and the principles and instructions of the Word of God. I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. In other words, the reward or, the, or what we'll gain from that, the benefits that you will gain amongst God's children come from our observance of the Word of God, His commandments, His way of doing things. So a successful ministry is dependent upon the Word of God, upon being built up with, with, with the Scriptures. And it's it, we're, what Paul is saying is, I'm, I'm leaving you to God and His Word. You know, we should... We should do all that we can to do the work of the ministry, every one of us. We should do all that we can. But we should never think that we are the means by which the work of the ministry is successful. It's not, an in, it's not about an individual. It's not about the, you know, not, hey, pastor does everything right. No, that is so far from the truth. It's not, it's not about an individual. It's not about a group of guys that got it all squared away and worked out. It is our dependence upon God. We should never think that we are able, because we need God all the time, through every step. It is all about God. And so when Paul is speaking to them, and he's, and he's saying, listen, I'm going to commend you. To, we see it here in Acts chapter 20. We see it back in Acts chapter 14. These are both ministries that Paul was... Uh, was uh, instrumental in 
uh, beginning. We see that in both of these cases of, of Paul's um, focus of attention away from himself. It, it wasn't like, hey, guys, let's just do it this way. Just follow, you know, the, the, I got this thing all squared away. He understood. You need the Lord. God's going to need to take care of this. There's a great verse of scripture back in the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 127, verse number 1. Many of you have this memorized. You know it. Psalm 127, 1, that says, that says this, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. What a great verse of scripture. This verse is true about your household. It's true about our nation. It's also true about the Lord's churches. It's also true about our church. And we're not just talking about a construction project. <laughs> Although we certainly need the Lord in that. But we're talking about the establishment of a church and its continuation in the work of the ministry and its ability of reaching souls for Christ. Its ability of, of, of not just numeric growth, but spiritual growth. Except the Lord build the house. Hey, you can draw a big crowd and just have a circus. You can, you can, you can build a a tremendous mega church, I suppose, and all kinds of of um, uh, of fleshly things, earthly delights. But you know, if you want to build something that has eternal value, the Lord's got to do it, and Paul knew that. And Paul was letting those folks know in that early church these these men that they're ordaining, saying, "Listen, if if this is going to work, God's got to do this," and he's he's turning them over to the Lord. That's, that's a lot of trust in Paul's half, uh, on Paul's behalf, but it's also a lot of trust on those men's behalf and those, and those churches. You know, the uh, uh, scripture says in the book of Zechariah, it says this, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That is such a true verse, always has been. You know, Paul would not always be there to help but God would always be. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll, uh, with, I'll be with you even till the end of the world. So he, that's the promise he made to his church. And it's the promise that Paul is conveying to them. Because Paul can't always be there. But the Lord would always be there. Now, Paul could warn them. That's what he does there. That's what he was doing there in Acts chapter 20. He was warning the church, uh, the men from the church in Ephesus. He, he's not always, he can warn them, but he's not always going to be there to fight the war for them. But the, but the Lord would. The Lord would go to battle for them. You know, Paul could teach, but you know, only God can transform lives. And so those folks in these churches need to understand that, that if we want to see lives changed, we've got to trust in God. This is not about self-sufficiency. It's about complete sufficiency in God to commend someone to the Lord, to commend someone to God, to have a church that is set to commence, set before. It's an attitude that we need to have as a group of believers here at New Testament Baptist Church, that we are completely dependent upon God, that our every ministry that we're involved in. Every time that we start something, we've got to be dependent upon God. You know, it's not about discipleship, and we need to disciple. It's not about training for the ministry, and we need to train. It's not about preparation, although we need to prepare. But what it is about is an understanding that without God, we can do nothing. We are completely, 100%, dependent upon God. And this is, this is a main ingredient to the work of the ministry. I want to end by just reading a couple verses of Scripture. And these, uh, um, these two verses, I, I, matter of fact, I read these verses just a few weeks ago. And uh, Brother Aaron Boyd, who passed away uh, a little over four years ago uh, now, these were his favorite verses. I know I, I quoted these a few weeks ago in another message I had preached. And... Um, these are these are so true. Tr this is Proverbs three. 
verse number five and six. You know the verses? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse number six says this, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And this is what Paul was doing to these men that were being ordained and set in these churches as pastors. He was letting them know, he was, if, he was setting them before God and letting them know that if this thing's going to work, this is what you need to do. This is a main ingredient to the work of the ministry for all of us. So let me remind you again, these are some, these are the basic ingredients for a successful ministry. And they are this, the preaching and teaching of the word of God, the confirming of the saints of God. We're talking about discipleship, strengthening, the exhorting of God's children, because we are going to go through some very difficult times and we all need encouragement to continue on. The ordaining of pastors and also deacons. Deacons are ordained also. These are the two offices in the Lord's church, pastors and deacons. But that involves this, this observation, selection, and identification of individuals to continue the work of the ministry. It's a vital part of the work of God. Prayer and fasting, there is nothing that can replace that in the ministry. Many churches are turned over simply to playing and feasting instead of praying and fasting. Nothing can replace that. And then the last ingredient, of course, is the commending. That is setting everything before God and relying upon Him to make it successful. And if we will do these things, God will do great things. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I'm so thankful that the work of the ministry can be very successful and that it is not solely dependent upon our abilities. But Father, far from it. We trust you. We honor you. We look to you. And we ask you, dear Father, to do great things through our ministry and the ministries in the future. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit works in our midst, has empowered us. And we thank you, Father, I thank you for each one who is a part of our ministry. Who, Lord, that you have given a, um, the gifts of the Spirit of God in each one that can be used for the work of the ministry, for the furtherance of the gospel, and for great eternal value. And Lord, we just look forward to seeing what great things you will do. Lord, thank you for this time tonight and your word. Pray it was an encouragement and a help to everyone. In this, Lord, I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for your attention tonight. I greatly appreciate that. We're going to be uh, ending uh, this uh, live stream and going to our uh, private prayer group. And I want to thank everyone uh, for being a part of the Bible study tonight. Lord bless you, and uh, we'll see you again soon.